the goal here is to make people lose faith in the government so it will destroy their national pride. They don't want the American men to have anything to fight for. And if they can demoralize them enough by lying and propaganda and doing things like the withdrawal from Afghanistan or letting in 20 million illegals, uh, you know, putting people like Daniel Penny in prison while all these criminals that are punching people in the face and Stabbing killing people, people yeah. are getting out the next day. This is the demoralization of the American uh, man for the intention to avoid some sort of revolution. What is up, guys? It's Andy Purcell, and this is the show for the realists say goodbye to the lies, the fakeness, and delusions of modern society, and welcome to reality. Guys, today we have Andy and DJ Cruz the internet that's what we're gonna do that's what cti stands for cruise the internet is where we put up topics on the screen we speculate on what's true on what's not true and then we talk about how we the people need to solve these problems going on in the world other times you tune in we're gonna have q and af that's where you submit questions and we answer them now those questions can be about anything but typically they're about personal development business entrepreneurship how to get better and kick ass in life you can submit those questions a couple different ways. The first way is... Guys, you can email those questions in to askandy at andyforsella.com. Or you go on YouTube in the comments section on the Q&AF episodes, drop your question in there, and we'll give you a, we'll choose some from there as well, give you some answers. So Then we have Real Talk. Real Talk is 5, 20 minutes of me giving you some Real Talk. Uh, and then we have 75 Hard Verses. 75 Hard Verses is uh, where people who come on the show who had a hard time before, come on and talk about how 75 Hard Program has improved their life, uh, how it's made it better, and how you can do the same using the 75 Hard Program. If you're unfamiliar with 75 Hard, it is the initial phase of the Live Hard Program. The Live Hard Program can be found for free at episode 208 on the audio feed only. Uh, there is also a book called The Book on Mental Toughness on my website, andyforsella.com. It's not required, but if you're somebody who wants to know the ins and outs and the ups and downs, uh, it's a good book. It's got the entire Live Hard program, 10 plus chapters on mental toughness, how to make, how to build it, why you need it, uh, and then some case studies on some very famous people that you recognize on how they've utilized mental toughness to make their life better. Uh, we don't run ads on the show. I don't talk about, you know, all these things that companies pay me to talk about. I finance the show out of my pocket, so I make a deal with you guys. It's very simple. Uh, we are always battling censorship. We are always battling traffic throttling traffic bans, shadow bans, and we need you to help us get the word out. We talk about controversial subjects on the show. That's uh, what we do here. And the internet doesn't like that all the time. So uh, we need you to share the show. So that's the deal. When we say pay the fee, it means share the show. Uh, don't be a hoe. Share the show. All right. What's up, dude? Hey. Got a special one here today. We do. We have a fellow Missourian. Yeah. Now, are you from Missouri? Columbia. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, man. yeah. Fellow Shit, I thought you just had family there. Well, I do, but that's because I grew up there. All right, my mom's right. in the same house. Good old Missouri. So. I felt it when he walked in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Felt a little Hoosier. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I got a good buddy of mine on the show today, uh, who's come all the way from Hawaii, uh, Doctor Chris Free. What's happening, brother? Hey, thanks for having me. Andy. Yeah. So, Chris, Chris has a new book, and it just came out. It's called Operator Syndrome, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this today. Uh, what, let everybody know kind of your background. We've been friends for a while and we, we talk frequently, but, uh, let's, let's hear from you. Yeah, sure. Where do you want to start? Well, uh, how'd you get to become who yeah. you are? Okay. Well, we got, got to go back a long ways. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I was six years old, um, and, uh, I was in Taiwan with my mother cause my dad was a Vietnam veteran in Saigon. And my mom got, got it in her head that we should go be as close as possible. So my dad was not a combatant. He was a Air Force doc. And um, so I guess what I'm saying here is I grew up kind of in the shadow of the Vietnam War. And by the time I was a teenager, young teenager in the 1970s, uh, the Vietnam War had turned into a, you know, pretty much a clusterfuck for, uh, for both our countries. Um, and so, uh, my dad as a, as a physician was very, you know, very, um, hate, he hated what he had seen and, and what had be, been done and you know, not that he was, you know, necessarily blaming any particular government or side or, you know, it wasn't a political thing. It was just about the horror of war. 
and his uh, so he he took the family into the Quaker faith and a, and a tenet of the Quaker ethos is conscientious objector status and and a peaceful sort of view of the world and, and approach to, to other people. So that was, you know, formative experiences from, from my childhood. And then as a, also at the same time growing up, um, I had a great grandfather, my great grandfather, um, who I tell a little bit about his story in the book and the book is dedicated to him and the woman who, who saved him. He was a veteran of the Spanish American war. Wow. So he fought at the battle of San Juan Hill and came home and, um, we can, we can go down that rabbit hole if you want, but he was one of my heroes when I was a kid. And uh, so I would I would interview him and talk with him about his his experiences in Cuba. Um, his is the salient piece or one of the salient pieces of his experience was what happened when he came home. So the uh, can I tell the story? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, so. Um, Cuban, um, the Spanish-American War in Cuba lasted about three months. So it was a very short, low-intensity war by modern-day standards. You know, not a lot of American casualties. But they brought back tens of thousands of troops who were all sick. So they all had mosquito, you know, mosquito-borne illnesses, dysentery, malaria, you know, whatever. And they they put up a few tents up at the top of, of um, Long Island, the very tip Montauk point and they put up some tents and they they started bringing these sick soldiers home and mustered them out right there and, and had them in that camp till they got better and it was just a big muddy field rows of tents not a not a hygienic place and it was it became a, a national scandal a national disgrace and even the president went up and and, and surveyed surveyed it there was a woman mrs bean um mrs jack bean who took her she lived in New York City. She was wealthy. And again, this is 1898. So she's got a butler and a carriage. And, and she went up there and she took my great grandfather and four or five or six other men and, and brought them to her home and nursed them back to health in her house uh, with her family there. And it was a, you know, for me, that was a really powerful um, uh, narrative story. I'm not even quite sure what what's the right word to use here. But he, and then she, she, I think he was there for about six weeks. I mean, this was not, a, you know, three days and then you're gone. This was, he was very, very sick. Uh, he believes she saved his life and she gave him money to get home to Michigan, uh, where he, where he was from. And for the rest of his life, he talked about her and that effort, that civilian effort to save his life. So when I was a um, young man, I wanted to, after college, I wanted to help veterans. I wanted to, I, w I was never, never served, never, not, not a warrior, never put on a uniform, but I wanted to help those who did. So I went, got a PhD in clinical psychology, and then I went my first, last year of training, and my very first job was the Charleston VA, Charleston, South Carolina VA. So I spent 15 years working with veterans there, and that, that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to, um, I wanted to be part of the solution. And part of my, perspective today is we, we do have a VA and the VA does some things very well and it's obviously very important and, 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 and meaningful to many veterans, but we have a very disconnected and indifferent society. So our, our soldiers, our warriors, our veterans uh, aren't really connected very well, or maybe I'll say it the other way around, our civilian society is not very well connected to the men who, who, who protect and serve everybody and and I'm going to I'm going to lump and include not lump I'm going to include in the the men and women who who I try to serve and honor not just soldiers um, and veterans private defense contractors who have done quite a bit of work with but also first responders so law enforcement EMT firefighters and so on so that's what got you inspired to do the work that you're doing yep yep so, so when you when you started on your journey, did you know that that you were going to do what you're doing now? No. How no. to start? So I did 15 years at the VA hot, yeah. the VA system. And this is after you went to school after and got my your PhD, degree. right? Okay. Right. Yeah. So I, here I am, fresh PhD, clinical psychology, and I'm at the VA in Charleston, South Carolina, mm -hmm. 1991, and I left in 2006. 
And I love the patients I worked with. I really appreciated, enjoyed, and most of the colleagues I had in the mental health service mm-hmm. and throughout, you know, all throughout all of the hospital. But there were also some massive problems, systemic problems, uh, and that I would say are, were more than anything policy, not about the individuals, people there, but policy that was being set by our government and the leadership of the VA. And by the end of by the end of those. By, by 2005, I was very, I was demoralized because mm-hmm. what I was seeing was we as the mental health service and much of the VA, we're, we were doing at least as much harm as we were doing good mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. And um, some of my research was, was oriented and geared to pointing some of this out. And it was not well received. It was not welcomed by the VA. So we had have a whole conversation about the VA and why, why I believe it has failed you know, an, yet another generation of, of our soldiers and, and, and warriors. So you were putting out some criticism about how, and yeah. from a place of, right. we need to improve. Yeah. And they didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear it. And in fact, I, I kind of got spanked for, so I, I was a, I was a clinical psychologist, a therapist for, for full time, seven, for about seven years. And then I started getting federal research grants from NIH, National Institute of Health, to study uh, veterans and, and other populations with PTSD and anxiety and depression, depressive disorders. And, and um, but also included in that, there were some studies, we did some studies related to how the system served individuals, um, served veterans, and some of the incentives to be sick. Um, I mean, essentially the VA has, has a disability policy. People don't know this, but the VA spends more money on disability payments than they do on providing health care. Um, it's not really even that close. Yeah. It's a pretty significant difference. And so... So they're just saying, hey, you're messed up. We're just going to pay you. That's right. That's right. And you don't even... I mean, and you don't even have to get treatment yeah. to, to, to be able to receive that mm-hmm. that money. Many veterans do pursue treatment and do, get, do, do receive treatment, but they're not getting better, mm-hmm. at least not as far as the VA can show. Mm-hmm. The uh, I, I was just reading a paper yesterday that even even up to current day, present day, the number of veterans with PTSD disability who get better and then come off PTSD, come off that disability is a fraction of one percent. So ninety nine point nine nine percent of veterans don't get better from from VA PTSD care. That's crazy. What the hell? You know? Yeah, what are we doing? If what are we doing? I mean, this yeah. is tragic. Yeah, yeah. Why are we? Why do we spend thirteen billion dollars a year on mental health care that that cannot show any results? I mean, would you run? You you guys are you're, no. You're you're fucking businessmen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you find once one of your business important business units isn't producing any movement of the needle at all, and you're going to keep putting money into it? Probably not. Well, that probably co- I would just suspect that probably comes just like every other branch of the government the money's getting funneled into people's pockets yes yes and so here we have big government and and we've gone right now down the rabbit hole of the va which is cool um <laughs> there you know you could and you could look at many different policies um no accountability for employees or little accountability for employees little accountability for management uh little accountability for the veterans and and so um, there's a book called Wounding Warriors, Wounding with an ING as in it's still ongoing. And the subtitle is How Policy Makes Veterans Sicker and Poorer. And it's it's a really good book published in 2020 by a, by a um, former West Pointer who lost a leg in Fallujah combat. And he and a, and a Wall Street Journal reporter analyze the VA's policies, but they, they put it into real human terms. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a page turner. It sounds boring and dry, but it's a page turner to read about how veterans' lives are being affected. And and in the book, there is a chapter, they interviewed me, and there's a chapter on some of my experiences in 2005 where we had done a study, um, and this sounds so like almost obvious that, that I'm almost embarrassed to kind of describe this, um, but we, we did a, we just took a, um, a hundred consecutive men coming into our clinic saying they were Vietnam veterans and we evaluated them and, you know, we did it, we did it the whole thing. And then, uh, about a year later we did the, and, and I mean, that wasn't part of the study. That was, that was just 
clinical care. But we, we did a Freedom of Information Act request. So we wrote directly to the St. Louis military personnel records and we got their DD-214s, you know, the, the one page document that lists everything of their mm -hmm. military career. And what we, and then we compared it, we compared that document to what they told us they had done during their career medals, deployments, training, you know, all, all of that kind of stuff. And there was a massive discrepancy between what people reported and what was actually true mm -hmm. um, with, you know, there were, we, I think we had five or six guys who claimed they were Navy SEALs or Green Berets. <clears throat> they weren't. They were not, yeah. They were not. Um, we also published a series of studies showing, you know, just very gross malingering and overreporting of symptoms in order to get the disability. Mm -hmm. So, because they know it's incentivized. It's incentivized yeah. exactly. They're rational yeah. actors. You know, you put a great big, you know, pot of gold out at the end of the rainbow, and people are going to go. Yeah, they're going to figure it out. They're mm -hmm. going to figure it out, and they're going to yeah. go get it. And why shouldn't they? And many of these people, many of these people needed help. I'm not. Our, I'm not. I'm not saying we shouldn't give help, but why? put it in the box of, of PTSD disability. First of all, PTSD is a very treatable disorder. Civilians get better from it. Mm -hmm. um, and I've treated many civilians who got wildly better very quickly. Uh, many, of my, many of my patients at the VA got better, but then they say, please don't document that because I don't want to lose my disability. Mm -hmm. I understand that. So what happened at some point in 2005, we submitted this, this paper. You guys heard of the book Stolen Valor or the concept mm -hmm. yeah. Stolen Valor? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the Stolen Valor Act was inspired by and facilitated by a guy named Jug Burkett who wrote a book called titled Stolen Valor in mm -hmm. the late 90s. Jug was a Vietnam veteran, and he, he noticed that just everywhere he looked in the 1980s and 1990s, there were people using the Vietnam veteran uh, status as a way of getting getting things in society, elected sheriff, um, you know, advertising uh, for a business, and, you know, just, you know, you name it, people who are appearing in, in episodes of 60 Minutes and such. And he would do this Freedom of Information Act request, get the records, and then document that they were liars. They weren't even veterans, most of them. That's crazy. And he wrote a book about this. And That's then he, a lot more common than people think. Isn't it's it? very common, yeah. yes. Uh, and and it is it is a it is illegal now to do that, and it's illegal to wear medals you didn't earn, um, or to to represent medals you didn't earn. But so Jug Burkett and I became friends, and he he helped me do the study. I worked directly with Jug on this study in two thousand. I guess we did the study in two thousand and four, and we published it in 05. We had initially submitted the paper to the American Journal of Psychiatry, one of the top two psychiatric journals in America. And it, it got rejected right away with a very short review. Usually you get extensive reviews that, you know, in the peer review process is, is the quality control. But what they said was they didn't have any criticisms of the study. They just said this can't be true. Because if it, if, if it is, this upends everything the VA is doing. So therefore, it can't be true. We're not going to publish it. A few days later, I get a phone call from one of my mentors one of the senior people in the in the field of PTSD, who's who was one of the directors of of a one of the, the there's a network of PTSD centers nationally, and he was the director of one of them for the VA. And he called me and he said, "You can't publish this paper; it's too explosive. If you publish it, uh, it risks you know Congress might cut our funding. It might it will harm veterans if you do this." And so he and, you know, in a, we have a discussion, but he eventually said, if you if you do this, it's going to, you know, it'll your, your career as a scientist will be over, you know, severely damaged. And I, I basically thanked him and, and said, but I'm going to publish it anyway. And we did. We submitted it to the British Journal of Psychiatry and it got published like they took it and they were like, wow, we want this. And not only did they publish it, but they had one of the top British um, military historian psychiatrists, kind of a mixture of both his, history and psychiatry, wrote a really you know eloquent com commentary companion piece to it. Uh, that guy now, by the way, is now has been knighted since knighted. So it's Sir Simon Wesley uh, who wrote it. that. Um, and a few months after it was published, I get a phone call one night about nine o'clock saying, "Hey, uh, guess what? You're being investigated by the VA." Um, I know it's nine o'clock at night, but he, I, we just sent you the questions you need to respond to, and we'll see us tomorrow morning at seven a.m. in the director of the VA's office. 
And so I show up there and there was a, we had a conference call with people at central office in DC and they, it, was, it was a witch hunt. They were looking, you know, did I have IRB approval? Did I have R&D approval? Did I have this document signed? You know, it was basically- They're trying to find a hole anywhere. Any technicality. Show me the man, I'll find the crime. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's just like we're seeing left and right yeah. today. But this was 2005. Um, so not that I was surprised by it, I'm going to say, because I s had started to see more and more of this kind of stuff coming my way. Um, but guess what? Every I had been dotted, every T had been crossed, and they had nothing. And they said, okay, we're done. And that was it. That was, it got dropped. But then I'm getting phone calls and requests for interviews, BBC, The Economist, Wall Street Journal, LA Times, New York Times, Washington Post, and they're all calling me for interviews because people want to talk about this. And so what the VA did right, right, right early on was I basically had a full-time, not a full-time, but there was a, a PR person who became my handler. Mm -hmm. Everything, I, every request had to go through her. And not only that, but she had to, uh, she had to be present at the interviews and she had the ability to interrupt, she had the right to interrupt the interview so a question, if, if a question got asked, she had the right to immediately interrupt and say, nope, he can't answer that question. And if I did answer a question, she had the right to say, strike that. He's not supposed to, he's not allowed to answer those questions. So uh, it was, it was, it was, that was eye opening. That's like, crazy. Like communism. It, it, exactly. It was, <laughs> it, was, it, uh, it was censorship. Now, I do understand that organizations when you work for an organization, you can't just go out and say whatever you want, and you know, especially if it's false or something like that. But, but I, I was speaking truth, and I had data, I had empirical data that supported everything I was saying. And, um, and after that, I was just, I was just fucking done with the VA. Mm -hmm. um, so I left the next, you know, a few months later, and I was like, well, you know, I wanted to help veterans. Oh well. So, but the VA is not really wanting my thoughts, my ideas, so I left the VA at that point. I moved to the University of Hawaii, thinking I was done working with veterans. And I was for about for about uh, eight years until kind of this next chapter of my life developed. And what happened in the next chapter? So I was, I had a, I had a really um, kind of a weird, weird job situation. I had a full-time job in Hawaii but I got recruited away to Baylor College of Medicine in Houston to be director of a research pro, a director of research programs at the Menninger Clinic, which is a very famous old psychiatric hospital. It used to be in Topeka, Kansas, and had now just a couple years prior had moved to and, and affiliated with Baylor College of Medicine. So I was a tenured professor at at at, at BCM, and I was directing the research at this hospital, and and so I moved to Houston, worked there for six months. Some shit happened. Um, the economy changed. the The research budget, as a result, changed. Um, no harm, no foul. I wasn't, you know, really good terms with everybody. But I decided to go back to my former job at the University of Hawaii. And when I did that, the, you know, my immediate, uh, the chief of staff at the hospital said, "Well, in the chair of the department, so we'd like." for you to continue your work here if you're willing to do this for for a few months four or five months till we find your replacement so i said okay and we we, we agreed i would come back for one week every month commute to, to keep the work going and then of course you know working doing some stuff remotely and um it was nice because it fit with my research interests you know that that matter for my my academic career and my work at university of hawaii but they never found my replacement so I did that job for a decade, um, and Houston became essentially my second home. They wow. never, you know, I just, it worked out so well, we just kept it going. Um, so I, every month for 10 years, about 10 years, I was commuting. So I had, and then- From Hawaii to Texas. Yeah, from Hawaii Damn. To, to, to Houston. Jeez, that's crazy, <laughs> yeah. dude. Yeah. Man, did I wish I had a private jet back there. Yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Delta, Southwest, where you? <laughs> yeah, Delta, Delta took good care of me. Yeah. yeah. And so, so I was making friends and I am a so-called PTSD expert and that was an eight, a little bit of the nature of what we were doing. And we were doing brain scans. Uh, we, we, one of our philanthropy, um, philanthropists, um, the McNair Foundation that, that owned and owned the Houston Texans NFL team funded a lot of our work, most of our work. 
much of our work. And so one of the things that they had bought for us was essentially an all-you-can-scan coupon. So we had a deal at the Baylor College of Medicine Neuroimaging Center. We were sending every single patient that came into the hospital over there to be scanned as part of clinical, but also mostly research. I mean, this was all done under an IRB um, auspices. And so I started meeting people just in the community, not affiliated with with, with um, um, the hospital or the, or the medical school. And a lot of them, you know, they were I'm just making friends with people. And some of them were, um, one of them was a former SEAL, recently um, separated. And then there was a, another guy who was, was Army SF and then one of the tier units on the Army side. And so I kind of developed a small group of just, you know, friends. But part of their part of our early conversations were, hey, you're, you know stuff about veterans, you know stuff about mental health, so let's have some conversations. And that began, that just began the, con and so it was literally just informal conversations over beer, coffee, or pizza, and essentially the conversations pretty much all went the same way. Doc, Chris, what's wrong with me? I don't know what's wrong with me, but something is different, something's off. I look in the mirror and I don't look the same. Even my face physically doesn't look the same. I don't have any energy. I don't have much motivation. Um, it's not, I don't think I'm depressed, but I'm not sleeping. I'm irritable. My girlfriend doesn't want me around very much, drinking too much. Ugh, what's wrong? Um, okay, I got this. I'm a, I'm a PTSD expert. I know how to help you. So I thought, and turns out I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and they didn't have PTSD, not in the prototypical sense of PTSD. There was not the fear. There was not the fear reactivity. There was not the, you know, helicopter fly over overhead or fireworks. No problem. That didn't, that didn't spark, you know, that didn't get the pulse up at all. So, and there was no avoidance. That's the other, that's one of the other key features of, of PTSD is avoiding those things, avoiding the things that will be reminders of military experiences and war and training experiences. So now what the hell's going on? Um, just through trial and error, we started trying things. Let's get some testing done. Let's draw some blood. Let's, let's get your brain scanned. So I got brain scans on a small, like, Five, five of my friends through this, through this, uh, you know, through this deal we had, um, and started getting sleep studies, and, and it turned out, whoa, I've, all these things I was not expecting to see. So all of my friends now in this circle are from special operations. They're not all SEALs. They're not all Army. They're from from different groups, but they all have the same pattern: low testosterone, mm -hmm. clear brain injury. Uh, their, the ventricles in their brain uh, on an M MRI, fMRI were, were atrophied to the point that they looked like 80-year-old men. They're 35, 38. Low testosterone in a brain. So their libido and their testosterone and their brains are all, all look like 80-year-old men. And these guys are studs. Mm -hmm. So what the hell is going on here? Um, on the sleep studies, it, they... It's they start showing up as with sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea, which again, I think of that as a condition that middle-aged, overweight men have. So what the fuck? Mm -hmm. uh, this is not PTSD. This isn't even mental health. This is physiological problems in multiple systems in the body. And, you know, as we figured these things out, and, and, and for those of you who maybe for the listeners and those of you who aren't, aren't familiar, if, if a man who has low testosterone, the effect of that is going to look a lot like depression. That man is going to have, um, he's going to be irritable. He's going to have insomnia. He's going to lose muscle mass. He's not going to feel motivated. He's going to be apathetic. He's going to be down and he's just not going to know, you know, what's going on. You treat that testosterone and all that stuff pretty much goes away. And there's many ways to treat testosterone, low testosterone. So I'm not, I'm not saying everybody needs testosterone replacement therapy, but you address that, you address the sleep apnea, um, you start doing some of the things that are good for the brain and, and wow, game changer. So um, 2014, 2015, pretty soon I have, I have not just my friends, but I have their friends. 
and then their friends. So it was literally just a word of mouth snowball. Um, if, if we, so we go fast forward today, I've probably consulted with about 500 operators over the last decade. Some just two or three, four conversations, but some in, in dozens of conversations mm -hmm. spread over many years. Mm -hmm. um, of, of that whole group of people, I would say uh, a, large a large portion of them are, have been private defense contractors who I, I do get paid for that work. Um, I do that, that work is through a, through a law firm um, that's trying to help them with uh, Defense Base Act claims, but same pattern. Mm -hmm. Same exact pattern of injuries. So that that's what my book. So that's what operator syndrome that's is. That's what operator syndrome is. So it's TBI. Well, let me, let me, before I even say that, we wrote a paper in 2020, a medical paper. We published it in, I think it was the International Journal of Psychiatry and Medicine. And it was me and a good, a good team of people. But it was a very simple paper. Anybody who wants to read it can find it on the internet. Just type in operator syndrome. That paper is out there. You can download it easily for free. Um, and it's just descriptive. So I literally, we literally wrote the paper for guys to read and for their spouses to read so that they could start to at least begin to get a, a sense of, shit, man, this stuff is not abnormal. This is, this is, this is normal for people who have had 10, 15, 20, 25 years in special operations. Mm. So what is operator syndrome? TBI, chronic pain, sleep apnea, insomnia, low testosterone, as well as other hormonal um, dysregulation. The estrogen levels often go, spike way up. In fact, there's a VA surgeon who, who reached out to me and said that after the paper was published, reached out and said that was amazing paper because it helped her understand why she's doing so many breast reduction surgeries in men coming out of Ranger battalions or Air, you know, Air Force PJs. Yeah, gynecomastia. Gynecomastia, yeah. yeah. Wow. And, and, and I mean, think about that, how, how humiliating that, that must be yeah. to, to be a, you know, to be a badass motherfucker. And then you're Grossing going, and then you're going boobies. breasts. Yeah. yeah. Like man boobs. Um, and then of course, so operator syndrome, all those things, which are very physiological, cellular, molecular injuries at that level. And then of course you do have depression and anxiety and anger, a lot of anger, um, addiction, uh, some have PTSD. Most have some of the other symptoms of PTSD. And and then what does that do? That just kind of goes out in a, in a ripple effect. It affects your family, your marriage, your sexual functioning, your emotional intimacy, connection with other people. And um, the transition out of the military. Um, and then you've got all the existential issues. The survivor's guilt, the... The horror of killing, the thrill and enjoyment of killing, which a lot of guys have, and are feel pretty pretty guilty about having because you can't talk about that typically yeah. with most people. Yeah. Can I ask you this? Because I I love this. I love this shit. I love it. Um, did you see a difference? You know, looking at like the the, the Afghan withdrawal, right? Yeah. Was, was there a yeah. difference in? function or how these people you know how, how these veterans you know after witnessing that did it did, was there a change in in mental statuses like with, with the guys that you were seeing coming in or guys you see now yeah. I guess, since, yeah. so that was what 2021 right right dj thank you for asking that question uh i don't get at ask that question often enough and i'm so i'm really happy to speak to that so um i'll say a few words about what kind of what i saw about that uh, in the two months prior to our withdrawal, I did, I think, four evaluations um, via Zoom, via distance communication with um, Afghani interpreters who were in Kabul. So it was like this slow motion disaster that I could see coming because I was talking to these guys who are in Kabul and they're, they're saying to me, help us, get us out of here. We are going to about to be overrun in a few weeks by the Taliban, and they're going to come and slaughter us and our families. Um, two of those guys, two of those uh, those interpreters, took me around, and you know, and remember this is a Zoom video, and they introduced me to all their family, their wives, their children, just trying to show how you know desperate and and, and th they are. Um, I don't know what happened to them. Um, it it uh, it. You know, it kind of rekindled some of my childhood experiences. Uh, one of my favorite babysitters uh, in 
in as a, when I was about 11, was a, a Vietnamese man studying in the U.S. And in 19, uh, I don't remember what year it was, but he went home um, as the country was falling to the North, North Vietnamese. He went home to be with his wife and his um, and his uh, children. He was working on a dissertation at Mizzou, University of Missouri, right, right down the road. And uh, he went home, uh, man, in probably mid-30s, went home and was picked up and murdered, you know, executed by the North Vietnamese government. Fuck. I don't know what happened to, to my guys that, were, that, that I was evaluating, um, but you could see it coming. They mm-hmm. knew what was happening. Mm-hmm. They knew what was coming. They were terrified. They were absolutely terrified. Mm-hmm. And they were, um, they, they knew what our, apparently our State Department and, and leadership in the U.S., claimed they didn't know. We were saying, oh, everything will be fine. The Afghan government will hold. Mm-hmm. Um, the Taliban, they're not, they're not gonna, they're not gonna get, get in here. Yeah, it took like a day. Uh, yeah, uh, la- no, not even a day. Yeah. They were there before we got out. So then I was talking, you know, months later, I did, I was, a, I, I did, I have evaluated and talked with extensively two different guys who were, contractors who were there at the airfield uh, during that, literally during that time. So one, they described the firefights that were going on around the perimeter of the, of the airfield the day before, very intense firefights with, with Taliban and other insurgents. One of them was near Abbey Gate when it, when it blew up and killed those 13 Marines plus dozens, maybe hundreds of, of Afghanis that were packed around that. And then they were a little bit later, uh, they were sitting or they were guarding, you know, one end of the airfield when the Taliban approached. So they were in an active gunfight. They were they were troops in contact moment when the bodies start flying out of the, falling out of the sky. Remember those Afghans yeah. that were grabbing yeah, the wheels? Yeah, those freaking crazy. Those bodies were were landing on their position, like you're you're shooting at you know, you're in a, you're engaged with the enemy and boom thud splat. The State Department guys didn't get to sit at sit at the ramp ceremony. They didn't get to participate in the ramp ceremony for those Marines. They were f- prevented pretty forcibly from from being at that ramp ceremony. So, how did this affect people? Well, one thing is, I mean, the story. I think just kind of telling the story a little bit here gives you some sense of what was happening on the ground. The um, I know a lot of guys for months afterwards that were sleeping two, three hours a night or less because they were on the phones. They were, there was a very organized um, effort from service members who were in the U.S. and other places around the world trying to get their buddies, their friends, the interpreters, the Afghani interpreters who, who they had known and trusted and worked, worked with and mm-hmm. closely and viewed as brothers. They were trying to get them and their families out. And many have gotten out, but many, you know, many, many didn't. Mm-hmm. And we still don't know how many, I, I still don't know how many Americans are, are or were, never got out of Afghanistan. Well, they're certainly not going to tell us. You know, no. no. No, no, they're not. They, uh, you know, they've treated those uh, families of those 13 victims like total shit. Yep, mm-hmm. yep, yep, they have. It's demoralization. So, so it's demoralization. Yeah, that's right. I mean, did that affect hormones? Did that affect uh, mental mental health and pain? Yeah, probably negatively, but but that demoralization was just crushing. Yeah, and um, now you have we have a we have a generation of soldiers who are going. Why did we do this? Why what were these? What were these last twenty years about? And um, and it's not just that their sacrifice was some of them feel that their sacrifice was wasted, but also asking the question of, of why did we lose so many of our brothers, both, both Americans and, and our allied forces and our local, you know, local uh, forces. So that demoralization is something that I don't think most Americans see or really have an awareness of because our, our society is just so removed from the realities of our military and the, mm-hmm. the men and women that serve. Considering what's going on, I mean, it makes sense you would demoralize the military first or the veterans first. You know, when you when you create a situation, let's just be real, like January 6th, where they say it's something that it really isn't, 
um, and then you do the Afghanistan withdrawal right after that, that's that's going to be very demoralizing to any of the veterans that serve. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. So, dude, you have a just to cap this on operator syndrome and we'll get back. We'll get into the show. But you have a very interesting. uh The way you look at mental health is is much different than what most of what we see on the internet as mental health. Um, And you and I have talked about this before, you know, the therapy industry for the most part. Industry is a good word. Yeah, it's it's not really geared towards getting people better. It's geared towards propagating customers and keeping them in therapy for as long as possible. Um, And at some levels, it's predatory, you know, and, and I'm not trying to discourage anybody from that that's not what i'm saying but i'm saying that you know there's good and there's bad but your your opinion on this uh or what you know operator syndrome is about and i agree with you is that it's actually inverse of what most people think most people think that mental health and correct me if i'm saying this wrong but most people believe it is mental but you've discovered that it's actually a physiological thing in a lot of people that's my perspective. Yeah. I, think, I think we put the mental illness up front and everything else is just kind of background. And mm-hmm. I think we need to, 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 to reverse the foreground and the background. Mm-hmm. Um, something that, that, you know, that I feel terrible about when I really kind of reflect back on the, my work at the VA was we never checked hormones. We never tested hormones um, ever. That doesn't mean that they weren't getting their hormones checked if that if something was picked up. But that a, seems like it should be a pretty obvious should, process. It should be a requirement, yeah. I would say. It should be step one or get your that, that should be one of the very first things that we do and, mm-hmm. and we don't. And that's that's on the the field that's on the mental health field. Because I like I said, I've worked now in three different psychiatry departments. Psychiatry departments are pretty large. You know, you might, we've had probably 120, 150 faculty, and they're multidisciplinary. So, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, nurses, geneticists, neuroimagers, neuropsychologists, you know, and more. Not once did I ever, do I, did I, did I ever have an endocrinologist in any department I was a part of? Mm. Not once. That's not to say that there isn't. You know, there there isn't research on hormones and psychiatric functioning, but it's that's just that's just not at all. Do you think that? Do you think the opinion of of that kind of like I feel like society has changed their viewpoint on things like hormone replacement therapy or just monitoring hormones over the last twenty years? You know, I can remember. Um, you know, when I was younger, how villainized testosterone was. Right. Mm -hmm. And I am of the opinion that it's villainized intentionally to keep men, uh, in a, in a weak state, quite honestly. Um, I think it's done for control. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, but let me just say the American psychological association put out guidelines about five or six years ago, guidelines for how therapists should treat men and boys. And those guidelines are an abomination. Those guidelines encourage therapists essentially to feminize men. Yeah, well, that makes it goes along with what I'm saying. Toxic masculinity is now yeah. considered to be part of the mental health problem that okay. we have. So we got we yeah. to somehow shake that out of them. Yeah, while they're growing man boobs. While they're, while they're growing man, <laughs> man boobs. Yeah. And that's boys and yeah. men. That's not just yeah. uh, it's not just men. So a well, big uh, problem with this mental health, dude, is that men aren't allowed to be men. That's a real that's real. You know, we've let we've dealt with culture so long in the last 20 years that has gone along with that where it's been villainized. And now you have women getting punched in the face on the streets of New York every yeah. single day yeah. saying, where's the men? Well, fuck, bro. You didn't want any men. You say you didn't need men. You socially castrated them. Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> That's yeah, that's socially and and, yeah. and now chemically. Yeah, right, right. I want to ask you this because I, I think this is a cool, cool, uh, cool thing. Like I, said, I love the the psycho uh, psychological psychology. Psycholo- that's where DJ went to school for. Um, psychology, psychology, and yeah. uh, you know. And so there's a saying: psychology, you know, genetics loads the gun, environment pulls the trigger. Mm. Right? Was there? Yeah. Have you noticed any like you know? Are there are there any like genetic predispositions that you that you guys have noticed? 
um, with operator syndrome of like, okay, these are some common denominators. Have has that been a, a, a focus point at all? I, I have not studied this. I don't think anybody specifically has studied it related to special operations. Sure. Not that I know of, but we certainly do know that genetics plays a large role in anxiety and, and, and depression and bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and, and addictions. So there's no question that there is a significant role for genetics. And, and we're starting to kind of identify some of even some of the genetic variants that specific gen genetic variants that yeah. are, you know, that are like you're going to probably be more susceptible to getting PTSD. Or yeah, yeah, right. right. And right. we've long known that if you have a parent with depression, you're more likely to have depression. Well, also, you parents. learn that behavior, too. Right. That's the environment. Well, yeah. that's nature. Yeah. That's the yeah. nature. Yeah. And nature. Yeah. So yeah. the nature is the genetics and the, the nurture is is what you've learned mm -hmm. and what society has taught you and, and everything else that's that's been around you. What's your opinion on victim culture? Oh, <laughs> Well, I mean that that's the heart that's part of the heart of the matter right now, isn't mm -hmm. it? Um, we are not telling people to be resilient. We're telling people you're oh, you poor person, you uh, oh, you need help. We're going to give you everything. Oh, you you're you're downtrodden, you're you're struggling. We can't say to somebody work harder. That's not allowed anymore in our in our culture in so many ways. Um, if, if you are, if you're, or push through or, or push get a little through. tougher, man, yeah. like this is how it is. Yeah. Cowboy up. Right. Uh, yeah. And I'm for, you know, we look before we get into that. Yeah. There's situations where people are truly fucked up. Oh, absolutely. That's not what we're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. But you know, it's become a, well, that's the thing. it's, it's become a badge trauma. of honor, dude. Yeah, there's real trauma, like going to war and, and, and having to do, you know, things that that are necessary and then you know there's losing your stuffed animal when you're fucking three and you're still crying about it yeah yeah <laughs> you yeah. know like there's a difference yeah yeah there's a difference there is i mean what do we what message are we sending our veterans when we when we say to a veteran congratulations you have ptsd you're fucked for life and you're going to get disability Here's yeah percent disability go home go. Yeah. be a psychiatric invalid forever and deal with this shit and be miserable exactly yeah because they're not getting better yeah. sitting on the couch and I mean, what's the wor what's the most important thing f f for a, for a person to feel alive and 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 healthy and vigorous? It is having a sense of meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. Yep. To, to to call somebody an invalid and tell them they're they're done being pr productive members of society forever, we've just stripped them of. Mm -hmm. I mean, we stripped them of their their manhood in a sense if, mm -hmm. if they're a man. Um, we've taken away their mission and purpose and their structure, their daily structure. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, it's that's tragic. Yeah, huh? Wonder why we have so many veteran suicides. Right. No shit. Or you know the biggest mental health crisis of all time. Well, we're enabling it because it's a massive fucking business. It's a almost four hundred billion dollar industry, right? Like, where do those customers come from? Right. You know, do you actually think it's healthy to be on your cell phone nine hours a day? You're a human being, bro. You're supposed to go out and do shit, build shit, create shit. Have a sense of purpose. Be thankful for where you are. Exercise some personal development, some discipline. These things, these things create. Yeah, yeah. Be, take charge of your life. Yeah, dude. And we got all these people who are told by these therapists, "Oh, you're broken. Oh man, that sucks." Yeah. Well, here, read these fucking passages and affirmations, and maybe you'll feel better. Like, mm -hmm. dude. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's it's a terrible system. Yeah. Uh, real quick, I wanted I wanted to bring this up because uh, right right before we get into our headlines, you're a metal guy. Oh yeah, heavy metal. Have you seen his list? Yeah. No. Okay, so we, I have a list here. I didn't know that either. That's awesome. You didn't know uh, that? No. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Listen, I, I, I didn't know you guys it. were stalking me. That's, that's, <laughs> that's okay. That's so right. so this is uh, Doctor Chris mm -hmm. Freeze fi uh, top fifty. I have his top ten here of the greatest metal bands. Okay. And I just want to see if there's a all right. Let's hear it. Any agreement in the room? So you got Black Sabbath is at number one. No question. I mean that's easy. That's a no brainer. <laughs> that's just like I don't even think I've heard of some of these. Iron Maiden. You don't Dude. know Iron Maiden, bro? Mm -hmm. I'm not a big metal guy. I like, I like Danzig. I fuck with Danzig. See, Danzig, a, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's an age you. thing. Yeah, that's, that's all it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, that's probably true. Yeah, Iron Maiden kind of hit the scene in 1980-ish. Okay. Yeah. All right, Deep Purple. Early 70s. Slayer. Slayer. I think, I, 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 obviously, I know Metallica. Metallica at top five, five. Okay. Is that is that accurate? Uh, Dude, this is a, this is, look, th there are ages of metal. 
Mm. Chris is a little bit older than me, and I'm older than you. Right. So, like, we're, all these rankings are going to be slightly different. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. And and actually, this is kind of an old list. Okay. Uh, I, you know, and I've moved these, I you know, like every few months, I, oh, I listen to a, a Motorhead now. I'm like, oh, I got to move them up. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, this is just, this was a snapshot. But yeah, that, that looks about right. Um, I might push Slayer up a little bit. Okay, Slayer's um, good. I am no uh, doubt. I am yeah. Slayer blow. Every time I hear a Slayer album, I go, "Oh my God, they're even better than I was." What's thinking. your favorite Slayer song? Song I couldn't I couldn't say that, yeah. but Rain and Blood. Rain and Blood is I, awesome. I, I guess the yeah. album and the song. Yeah. What I'll, I'll, or you got, yeah, you got the uh, you got some albums here. Yeah, the, you, got, you put what the greatest albums are too. These are your top ten. Yeah, Master of Puppets. That's for sure top ten album. Yeah, for sure. Although Peace Cells is it's for me, it's tough. They're like neck and neck. Yeah, and they came out in 1986, so they're both same year. Uh, and of course, uh, um, Megadeth was uh, Dave Mustaine's band after he got ejected from out Metallica. Of, from Metallica. Yeah. right. So um, that's a cool story. If people that don't know metal, you yeah, go kind of read the original Metallica and the Dave Mustaine yeah. and yeah. Megadeth story. It's yeah. cool. Yeah, he got a, he got he got a, Mustaine got rejected or got ejected from Metallica right before they recorded their first album, which Kill Them All. Yeah, Kill Them yeah. All, and he wrote, co-wrote several of the yeah. songs, three or four of the songs on that album. Yeah. Kill Them All is underrated, dude. I agree. Yeah, yeah. That's Four the, Horsemen, man. That's a great song. That's the first Seek and Destroy. Yeah, that's the first Seek Metallica album I, I listened to. It was their first. Me their too. First album. Yeah, and it was just like. A, the, the, it sounds like it's recorded in a garage. I feel like you, you, this is just like the best doc. Like you walk in his office, he's playing fucking. Metallica. Bro, we talk every <laughs> week. Great. <laughs> we we talk every week for at least yeah. an hour. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I think if you, I think this sounds funny, but I listen to to heavy metal when I'm trying to to, to work deeply. Mm. So when I'm writing, when I'm trying to think, um, that's this is what I go to. Yeah. I mean, sometimes jazz, sometimes sometimes classical. Yeah. But but if I really want to get in the zone and be productive, funny. I'm, I'm 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 that I'm, means I'm putting on you're the same way. <laughs> yeah. You know why though? I was just gonna say this about Chris, because at his core he runs hot, mm. as calm as he is, mm -hmm. and that's the same for me. When I get into that, when I get into that zone, mm -hmm. that's when I'm the most creative, mm -hmm. dude. Mm -hmm. And that's I start awesome. feeling like a bad motherfucker. I'm like, I can do this. I can do anything. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. a cool feeling. That's sweet, man. Well, uh, let's do That's a good list, man. I respect it's, it's, it. It's solid. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, even though I don't know most of them, but I know a few of them on there. Well, yeah. DJ, what? so, I mean, set the list aside. What, it, what, you know, in the metal sphere, what would you, like, is there other bands you would put up there? DJ just started learning metal, bro. Yeah, I just got into like, it. when he started okay. working with me four it. years ago. Yeah, I just okay. got into it. Yeah, he loves been, you're like a, men, a, a metal mentor. Yeah, for yeah sort movies. of. Yeah. He, he, it started like this. We were working out together, and I started playing this shit. And he's like, "What's that? What's that? Oh, that's pretty. What's that? This is awesome. Playlist, yeah, yeah. So like, we were listening to a lot of Rage Against the Machine, Metallica, Danzig, Guns and Roses, stuff that's on my workout playlist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Five Finger Death Punch. Yeah, Five Zoltan, Finger. I like yeah. them. All right. Yeah. 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 So it's just all stuff like that, and he, you know, he was. I don't know what were you into before that, like R and B stuff, and yeah, you know, just DJ plays the piano and sings. Shit. He's really, really good. Real good. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, and just to, just to say this, I love pretty much all. You know, I like all music. Yeah, all um, I do too. Yeah, um, yeah. R and B was is one of my favorites. Classic rock, blues. I had a blues radio show when I was in college. And, oh, that's yeah. cool. And, blues is cool, man. Oh, it's great yeah. stuff. It's great stuff. A BB uh, King Radio is one of my favorites on Pandora. Hmm. When I'm chilling and like in the bar smoking, just chill vibes. All yeah, day, 100%. yeah, it's good stuff. Is, is that all BB King or is it? No, it's just it's all, it's all blues. blues yeah. Yeah. yeah, nice. Yeah, I like Frank Sinatra channel too. That's a good channel. Oh like, yeah, I can do a little Dean Martin. Yeah, bro, it's yeah. good stuff. I like it all makes of you feel it. makes you feel classy. It does. Yeah, it tricks I, me. I, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was listening to uh, Chet Baker this morning on the on the ride in. Uh, he was a he's a trumpeter, j cool, smooth, cool jazz. Yeah. But he also he did a little crooning, so he did a little singing as yeah. well as playing. Yeah, yeah it, I, I like all music too, man. There's really not much I don't like. Yeah. Um, so what do you play? What kind of music when you when you're when you're playing? Same thing, yeah, a little bit of everything, man. I can, I'm a self taught, but I can do some classical. Yeah. Um, do classical, more pop hits. You know, a little country. I can do a little country. Yeah. Little hey, country just simple, too. man. 
Yeah. yeah. Leonard Skinner. I mean, yeah. I, I can okay. do a little bit right of everything, on. man. Right yeah. On. It's good. Yeah. It's good yeah. shit. I had no idea. We were we had the black <laughs> rifle show. We had the black show. rifle coffee guys on the show and uh and they were, we were hanging out at the house afterwards and uh fucking Matt picked up the guitar, starts playing mm-hmm. and I'm I was, sit- it was JT. JT was it was it, yeah. uh, whoever. I yeah. think one of them picked up the guitar and they started playing and I'm like watching him play. I'm like, this is pretty good. This motherfucker starts singing. And I'm like, <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah. And I'm sitting there like, what the, what's going on? Yeah, I'm, I'm a good good example of inclusion. Yeah. You know, of, that, of diversity and inclusion. <laughs> I'm a good nice. example of it. Yeah. So, All right, man. Well, guys, let's get into Let's do some cruising. We got, we got some stuff to cover. Um, guys, remember, if you want to see any of these pictures, headlines, videos, articles, links, go to andyforsella.com. You guys can find all of that stuff there. Uh, so with that being said, let's get to our first one. Um, now, you know, we record CTIs. They come out Tuesdays and Fridays, right? And so, like, there's going to be some gaps in coverage. But I wanted to, to kind of readdress this, um, you know, of, of this big uh, national event we just had this uh, earlier in the week. Um, the, the, the ship crashing into the bridge, mm-hmm. right? It's been a big story. Um, Baltimore ship black box data recorder taken by investigators as search for missing continues. Um, so they recovered the black boxes. There's, there's multiple of them, um, on this, uh, this massive cargo ship named Dolly. Um, and they're still doing recovery efforts, trying to pull through, pull through all of this. Here's the video of, of the ship crash. And this is, um, this has been circulated as the like the actual video, right? I know there was some. There's some fake ones. Yeah, there are some fake ones. Yeah. Um, but this is this is the official. Uh, this was from the stream time live Baltimore cameras, uh, supposedly allegedly unedited. Um, here's the clip. What, what time of what time of day? One o'clock. So this was one thirty in the morning. Yeah, yeah one thirty uh, Eastern time. Yep, yep. There's no audio on this, but you see it going. Um, it's passing out. Then it loses power. Oh. And it's just a slow motion disaster. For so it's me. going about nine miles an hour. And I'm not sure how much how much weight that thing. Oh. But, Where did this video come from? So this is coming from Stream Time Live Baltimore. Because I saw. Okay, the power comes back. Power's on. back on. Then it loses power again. So they don't know why it lost power yet. Is that? I think they know why. I don't think they're saying why. Okay. Thick smoke comes out of the, uh, Ooh, the exhaust that is thick there. Smoke loses power again. This is when they're saying, "Oh fuck." Well, they did send out a mayday. Maydays were sent out, and they they recovered. Like you see, a, a truck just went across the bridge. Yeah. Just so, right over. so one wow. thing to notice here. So during this whole time while they're going. Um, and they were able to confirm this with the black boxes that were recovered. Now, there's some interesting things with the black box. But um, so the bridge was under construction. So you can see lights like right here. Those pillar lights. And no, those working. are vehicles. Those are construction worker vehicles. The bridge was getting worked on. So yep. one of yep. the lanes going. Um, they were on the bridge. Were, were on there. And yeah, so fuck. this entire time that it's losing communication, um, they already started the notification process, which is why there wasn't as many or, or more people on the bridge that went under, um, because they were able to start closing down both. They were lanes. stopping traffic, correct, from going out. Um, but yeah, so these are all construction vehicles here, and so during this process, um, you know, everybody's just running to opposite sides, trying to get away from from uh, each side. But then it makes contact with the bridge. These are the last little few vehicles that go by. Now they're saying stop, stop, stop. They're holding the traffic. Did the workers see it coming? Mm-hmm. So they were scrambling, but weren't able. Some of them. Were. Then it makes contact. Bridge goes down. Boom. Oh my god! Wow, that was instant too. Yeah. Do we know who filmed those? This video, like who? yeah. So that that video was coming from off of uh, off the dock. Um, and one of the periods, it's just like a static camera that's okay. So it was like, yeah. a, okay, yeah. Now, so that, that so that's the clip of that, right? Now the issue is, is that you know there 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 was a report that was done that apparently, allegedly, the the black box recorder stopped recording for. There's about a two minute gap. What? Right. And then don't take my word for it. Here's a clip. At 0124 and 59 seconds, numerous audible alarms were recorded on the ship's 
audio, bridge audio. About the same time, VDR sensor data ceased recording. However, the VDR audio continued to record using the redundant power source. At around 0126 and two seconds, the VDR resumed recording sensor data. And during this time, there were steering commands and rudder orders recorded on the audio. At around 0126 and 39 seconds, the ship's pilot made a general VHF radio call for tugs in the vicinity to assist. About this time, the pilot association dispatcher phoned the MDTA duty officer regarding the blackout. Around 0127. Yeah. So there's about a two, two minute gap there from when it lost power. So there's two sensors. You got the audio recording that's happening. It's recording people's voices and, and the conversations mm -hmm. both in the bridge room um, and then in the rear of the ship as well. But then there is a sensor recorder that records all of the mechanical inputs into the ship, the steering, mm -hmm. the power. Mm -hmm. That went dark for two minutes. It's a two-minute gap, and then it cuts right back on right when they collide into the Would bridge. that be because the power went out? Well, so here's the thing. The audio recorder was on the power backup. The sensor input should have been on the power backup per the N NTSB regulations. Hmm. So now there's been, you know, there's been some talks, but let's, let's talk about the impact. Um, that well, I will had. say this. I want to say this, too. Mm -hmm. So I got, when these things happen, um, I usually get some feedback from people that were there. Yeah. And I did get a message from a guy who was a longshoreman who worked on that boat, and he had pictures to prove it. Like, That's he was it. in the water right after it happened, taking up, he sent me a couple of the pictures where they were up on the boat from another boat, like, literally right after it happened. Shit. So I know it was legitimate. And he said, he told me that that ship on the way into port had a power failure. And he said they worked on it in port and immediately after it left port, it had another power failure. Hmm. So he told me that this was an accident and that it was a legit power failure because I put a poll up in my story that said, what do you guys think, an accident or intentional? Because a lot of people were saying it was intentional mm -hmm. and that's how he DM'd me. So. Yeah. There's that too. Well, yeah, I mean, like, but the effects of it is real, right? Like, yeah. They're, they're, they're saying that this is probably going to take anywhere from five to 15 years to rebuild that bridge at the cost of over half a billion dollars um, to the tune of like $600 million um, to repair. Um, and of course, we're paying for it. Taxpayers are paying for it. Biden and, has already made that promise. And how much are we, is it going to cost to have that, that artery? interrupted yeah during that that's time. the real that's the real yeah. damage because you know this this port um it's it's the ninth uh, i'm sorry it's the fourth largest port on the east coast ninth largest in the country um it's a massive input for the country um, a lot of our vehicles go through there um to the tune let me find the numbers oh, i got in here um, it was something like almost every car I've ever ordered from Europe goes into Baltimore. Comes that car. Yeah. yeah, it's like almost like nine hundred thousand or so a mm. year mm. Um, are all coming through that that port. Um, and uh, what they're projecting, I mean, we saw like this. Uh, Ryan Peterson he, he reported on this. Um, he says this will surely cause even more cargo to shift to the West Coast, likely leading to congestion and delays. As we saw in COVID, even a ten percent or twenty percent increase in volumes can lead to a compound feedback loop of congestion and delays. Most ocean freight contracts are signed between March and May each year, uh, so many companies have the flexibility right now to sign contracts to ship their containers to the West Coast to avoid likely congestion and delays on the East Coast. Um, now, CNN puts this article out because there has been a lot of a lot of theories about this. Right? Mm -hmm. was, this was this intentional? Was this an actual cyber attack, right? Which are things that, you know, I don't feel like you can easily just throw off the table, right? Um, but you obviously want to make sure that you actually have some evidence or some type, something that can back up your uh, your, 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 your theory, right? Um, but CNN immediately puts this article out, um, calling out all of the typical people <laughs> for being conspiracy theories um, and how dangerous they are. Um, call them wild, cons uh, wild conspiracy theories about what supposedly had quote really happened. Uh, we're running rampant at uh, we're running rampant online now. Lara Logan. Well, what do you think fucking happens when you lie to people over and Constantly. over and over? Again? Yeah, exactly, exactly. 
<laughs> exactly. Um, you know, and, to, and and it's their same it's their same war cry. All, all the claims they're all baseless, entirely baseless. Right? It makes like, me think it was an attack, which which further yeah. leads to, to you know it does that doesn't help calm the people. We don't trust you. No, we, we don't trust shit. You we're guys to the say. point where everything the ma- mainstream media says. We've found the opposite to be true over the last four or five years. Mm -hmm. And so when they come out and say this shit, it's like, oh, well, shit, I guess it was that. Yeah. You know. Well, I I was just going to add, I mean, the rush to say these claims are entirely baseless. Yeah. And then the next sentence, it says officials are investigating the crash. Yeah. How do you know? How do you know it's they're baseless if the I mean, I guess they're saying there's no evidence for these. I mean, that could be one interpretation. of that. There's also no evidence for you to say that it's not. Yeah, right. That's right. Exactly. You know, and so, like, I mean, I I think when and again, when you look at the, the history of MSM, even our intelligence, like we don't trust you. You know, like there is yeah. so little trust right there now. Isn't. They have there. completely that that expectation of trust or like, you know, the like the, the reasonable expectation that we can trust these these news outlets or trust our even our intelligence ad- agencies to some degree. It's gone. Yeah, it's it gone. Is. And so I when agree. you come out, you know, two hours after this massive incident happens and immediately can jump on and say, oh, there was nothing wrong here. Nobody's really taking your word for that. Yeah. Yep. You know, like we need a little bit more, you know, and like and that's the beauty of, you know, the uh, you know, the the social world that we're in right now is that, you know, people are able to put in different inputs. And one thing that I've seen consistently um, from ex members of intelligence agencies, the, the, the consensus was that if if this wasn't an intentional attack. That's exactly how it would have been done, though. Does that make sense, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like if you were to tr- try to do an intentional attack on America's infrastructure, that would have been the 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 standard play to do. Right. It was it was right. executed perfectly. If that was, is how there is, is is kind of the consensus there. But but here's the interesting. So why everything? Why everybody was you know kind of looking over there? There's always something else happening in the background, right? Um, and so I was able to find the story, and I thought this was very very interesting. Um, literally, you know, that same morning rush time of, of news headlines and things rolling in while everybody's focusing on the bridge, um, the United Nations comes out and they declared that there is actual actually a genocide going on with the conflict in the Middle East. Um, and they put in a, a ceasefire in which the United States um, basically sat out from voting on which passed mm-hmm. the ceasefire 14 to zero uh, with the U S um, abstaining from the vote. Um, and so that's a big deal going on right now. A lot of people are not really talking about it, but the United nations did. Unanimously they recognized it as an official genocide. As an official okay, genocide. I saw the clip, you know? Yeah. And so it's like, nobody's really talking about that. Right. Yeah. And then fortunately it's the only genocide in the world right now. Right. For Sudan, now, Sudan and Darfur, yeah, and, right now, right. and we don't want to talk about any of that. None of that, yeah. none of that. Those don't count. That's it's just well, or or that we have more slaves in in slavery now than have ever existed ever. in the history of the world ever. And no, and people want to talk about what happened four hundred f- years ago that none of us did. We weren't even here for, it, but Fuck. it's happening right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm a fucking colonizer. <laughs> Got, we, that caused slavery because I'm white. Yeah, motherfucker. I didn't even our family didn't even come here until like 1920. Right. Whatever. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I mean that, that's an interesting thing. Netanyahu's pissed about that. He actually, uh, the Israel delegation, they had a trip that was planned here. They're supposed to be going to DC, I believe, in like a month or so. They completely pulled out of that. Um, and now there may be some communication issues between our diplomats and the diplomats of Israel. So, and I, and I saw a thing. Uh, shortly after Israel pulled out, there was a news story about Israel pulled out and the, the U.S. diplomats are confused and they don't understand what's going on. Right. It's like, hello. <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, I mean, it, it's a tough ball to play because, I mean, one minute you want to be on the side and one minute, you know, diplomatically they're on the side, but then the next minute they, they're abstaining from votes. They could have easily voted. An, an abstained vote is a yes vote. The tensions are definitely rising between the U.S. and Israel well, because, because Biden, and no, Biden and Harris have both come out because, dude, the left has, you know, completely turned Abandoned. on them. Yeah. They both come out and said, hey, we've warned them. We've told them uh, Biden got caught on a hot mic saying, I told BB he better stop this shit. Like, did you see that? And so, like, now and, and uh, Netanyahu's like, yeah, you know what? Fuck you. Mm-hmm. So now we have a situation where 
Israel's telling the U.S. to fuck off, and the United Nations has figured has decided it's a genocide. Mm. It's going to get interesting. Mm-hmm. Be real interesting because I don't see Israel backing off at all. No, no, they have no intentions to. No, I don't think they will. Um, but yeah, so I mean, the, the, like I said, the search operation is still going on. I believe they're still looking for six people. There's six six missing uh, citizens right well, now. And could I could I just uh, I'm looking at my phone because this story's been up all day on CNN. The lead story on the mobile CNN says headline. Deadly bridge collapse reveals a truth about immigration. Oh, that's interesting. So now we've changed the story. It's not about the bridge. It's not about the the ship. It's about all of the people who remain missing. And I'm reading here. All of the people who remain missing were immigrants, outsiders who had come to the U.S. from Central America for a better life. Uh, fair enough. But this is a truth. Well, that's because you let in 20 million of them and you say it's 12. But uh, <laughs> yeah. And then also, this, if that's true, Chris, you know what this really was? This was white supremacy exactly. terror attack. That's, climate change. That's the impl- this was a domestic terrorist attack. That's the implication. Yeah. And yeah. the wind because of the climate change. We did it. That's, mm-hmm. that's the implication. White people. Yeah. White pe- fucking white people. Fucking white people, Fucking man. white people ruining everything. <laughs> came, <laughs> came and make fucking chicken right. It doesn't make sense, man. Fucking racist white people tearing down the bridge to get six immigrants. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> these people think we're fucking idiots. Yeah, they do. Well, there are a bunch of idiots. They probably believe that. To be fair, yeah. You Nobody guys, listens. You guys, uh, the, the the term influence operation, are mm-hmm. do do you think Americans understand that term? No. Do you think Americans understand the concept of an influence operation? I don't think yeah. they understand that or propaganda. Yeah. Or they don't understand that Obama wrote out of a law that propaganda was illegal when he was in office. Right. And we're being propagated at a hundred percent propaganda since. COVID started full steam. Yeah, full yeah. steam ahead. Their their jo- the the goal here is to make people lose faith in the government, so it will destroy their national pride. They don't want the American men to have anything to fight for. They don't want American men to have anything to stand for. And if they can demoralize them enough by lying and you know propaganda and doing things like the withdrawal from Afghanistan or letting in 20 million illegals, uh, you know, putting people like Daniel Penny in prison while all these fucking criminals that are punching people in the face and killing people people, are getting out the next day. This is the demoralization of the American uh, man for the intention to avoid some sort of revolution. Yeah, combine, that's what that's about. Yeah, combine that with, you know, you talk about it with the operation. Which I actually think is just fueling that. Yeah, you know, but like low testosterone, that's not just, you know, that's not unique to the- Everybody should be on veteran, testosterone. Right? Like an I, a fucking I am drip. Yeah. 2,000 drink milligrams it. a week. Drink it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> In Don't a, take my advice, though. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I'm, not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I'm but, joking. But that's a real crisis. Maybe right half now. that, though. You know, yeah. a lot of the men, that's not just, you know, military or veterans. Like, I mean, well, the, right. I mean, we have a, a crisis of men and boys on our 100%. hands. 100%. What are young men doing right now? And I'm, we're, I know we've got more headlines. Cutting off their dicks? Yeah. Well, some of that, yeah, yeah. But but I think the bigger issue is they're not in the workforce. Mm hmm. They're not in college. Colleges are forty percent male, sixty percent females. Undergraduates. Shit, that'd be a good enough reason to go. Absolutely. That alone. <laughs> I, I know. Why, why? That's enough for. Yeah. Like one and a half. One and a half. <laughs> Bro, you can't even handle one. You need to shut up over there. <laughs> but but that's the thing. Where are they? They're in. They're. In, I mean, you know, this is an, you know, this is a, obviously a stereotype and a, and a big generalization. But they're in their parents' basement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Playing Hot video pockets. games. That's right. Playing video games. Um, Give me another hot pocket. <laughs> and then they're on the internet being like, fuck Andy and DJ. Hey, bro, I get it. They don't even wait for the shit to cool down. They eat it when it's hot. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I can see it. What was that? <laughs> is, that is that how you eat your hot pockets, bro? shit cool down, bro. They just, no, nah, I let mine cool down, bro, when I do eat them. There's a good medium temperature for Yeah, you gotta let pocket. it know. If you follow directions, it has to like rest for like two minutes before you. Before at least you. two. Yeah, at least two minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, All right, yeah, let's get on that. You, you mentioned the influencer uh, campaign. Yeah, influence let's talk op- about that. Influence operation. Yeah. Influence operation. What, what's that? Just so everybody knows. Well, influence operation is when the KGB decides we're going to undermine American society, and it's well, it uh, could be CCP too, right? It, yeah, I'm just as yeah, an yeah. example, right. just for example, KGB says, you know what? It's 1960, and America's our greatest enemy. Let's undermine their entire society. 
how do we do that? Well, let's let's go. Let's put some things into the educational system. Let's let's fund Greenpeace to to stir up concerns about the climate change. So they got they got. I mean, in the '60s, we had books about how overpopulation was going to destroy the world. Mm-hmm. Now we're on the verge of a population collapse that's coming. So quite right. the opposite of what was predicted by so many people in the 1960s. But the idea of the influence operation is let's destroy America from the inside by by creating, a, you know, havoc. You already said it. It's like, let's convince Americans that their country is evil. Mm-hmm. Let's convince Americans that, that one group is better than another group and they should hate each other and fight each other. And what, what, what better ways to do that than to create, uh, than to undermine the idea of what we were doing during the civil rights era. Right. right. Work that's already been done. Right. Yeah. We, we undid it. And hey, and we, so... I think it started in the universities. I think they got into the universities and they and essentially uh, um, influence operation. You start changing the minds of some influential people who who go out and they become act activists, no longer scientists, mm-hmm. but activists who are who are spreading what is essentially a virus. Uh, you know, a, a, it, when they say a mind virus, a, they a, mean a it. mind virus. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. exactly. It's ideology, man. Dude, there, there is, I, I've watched it happen in my life, dude. Like when I when I graduated high school, which was ninety seven. Damn. Yeah, I'm forty four years old, bro. What the fuck? <laughs> That's the math. <laughs> That's why I'm f-ing silver, silverish, and good looking. Yeah, you still it, look like a little boy. That's what it is. Yeah. Oh, hey, well, so hey. it is what it is, man. Get the f- up. Put your fucking hat back on. It's an improvement. <laughs> so, so, dude. I watched this, right? Like when I went through school, <clears throat> there was no such thing as a participation trophy. Mm-mm. There we 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 pledge allegiance all the way through high school at, at the beginning of school every single day. Um competition was taught, it was encouraged, achievements were encouraged, they were celebrated. Uh mm-hmm. desegregation programs were in the schools, all the schools, uh so that it taught, you know, inner city culture, black culture and white culture to to go together. And everybody was getting along for the most part. Bullying I, was okay. Yeah, huh? Bullying. I, I said bring. I, yeah, yeah, bro. Like real talk. Um, there was it was okay to have physical fist fights. That was, you got suspended for like a day, and that was it. And then you shook hands, and it was over. There's now now they've right after I graduated, they changed a lot of shit. They they stopped deseg. Okay, and what's the product? What's the product of stopping desegregation after 20 years? You have a black community and a white community that do not know how to relate. They don't know. All these white kids that you see on the internet posting BLM shit, they don't, they're doing that because they think that's what they should do. Right. If they actually understood, they wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be the way that they, that, that's what makes them feel guilty. Mm-hmm. It's the white guilt. All that shit comes from the end of desegregation. And then they removed competition. And then they started villainizing capitalism and achievement and the rich man and all this shit. And now we have a generation of complete fucking pussies with, that don't know how to operate in the real world uh, for the most part. Now, there are some really good ones. There's the kids whose parents taught them right, it, but they're the minority now. Uh, and um, and it, those parents are vilified for being too hard and too hard, yeah. irresponsible because yeah. they're not watching their child every yeah. moment. Yeah, yeah it's but crazy. They can let, a, let their kid cut their penis off and, and they're, they're praised as Listen, models. Listen, dude, that's going to go down in history. No different. This has already happened in history, bro. This happened. Fucking Jill Biden said it yesterday. Mm-hmm. It's she's like Berlin was the capital of progressivism. No shit. That's what the fuck the problem was. That's what caused them all the shit. Mm-hmm. People were doing all this crazy shit. They were doing all. They were cutting off their dicks. They were doing fucking. There was mother daughter prostitution, kid prostitution, and pedophilia was normal. No shit. That wasn't the height. That's not a good thing, Jill. No. Like, we don't want that here. And uh, she, she's, this has already happened. And so this era where parents are allowing themselves to uh, bend the knee to this ideology and letting their kids make irreversible, like, dude, those parents, like 20 years from now, are going to be like completely, first of all, they're going to be complete failures as parents. But second of all, they're going to they're going to be vilified and looked at like what the f- were you doing? Mm-hmm. Your kid cut off his genitalia. You allowed him to do that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. The good news is is that now it's been banned in like 30 states. A lot of states. But yeah. 
I mean, dude, it's it's crazy shit, and this has already happened, and it's destroying lives. Uh, it's not just the parents; it's organized the teachers. Yeah, it's, the, it's the, teachers. It's organized medicine, dude. I think yeah. these people that do this shit, like legit, the the medical doctors that do these things, should go to jail. That's my personal. That's my personal opinion. Yeah. They, they should go to jail. They that's, no, that's bare minimum. They're fucking doing it for money, bro. They're not doing it for the kids. If you listen to these detransitioners, they they will tell them like, bro, they put me on hormones after one fucking Zoom call. My surgery was scheduled for two weeks after that. Yeah, not like well, not that's that's a little exaggeration, but yeah, dude. I mean, they're putting them on puberty blockers and hormones and shit off one consultation, like. And they're shaming parents yeah. that, don't that don't play along dude, with that. Dude, some of them are legally removing the kids, kids from the home. Yeah, yeah, you lose your child. This is crazy shit, dude. And Sad. it's going to go down in history as a, one of the more one of the biggest moral corruptions and tragedies that's ever happened in human history. Yeah. Sacramento, California, I think, just declared itself a sanctuary city for children who want to transition. Didn't they? So, haven't they learned not to uh, call themselves sanctuary cities? <laughs> For other reasons, no, no <laughs> apparently they not. want that. Yeah, they want that. It's insane. It's insane. Um, yeah, it's insane. What's Let's headline two? Yeah, headline two. Let's talk about. Well, you, like I said, you brought up the influencer operation. Let's talk about influencers. We also said something about immigration, illegal immigrants. So let's just combine the two. Um, Venezuelan TikToker Lionel Marino. Grimaces in his mugshot after being nabbed by ICE for crossing into the United States illegally, then telling others how to on social media. Um, so you, you, we remember this guy. Yeah, oh, you remember this guy. guy. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's the guy who's who, who's like holding money and, yeah. and waving money on TikTok Dude. and telling people how to be, be how to take advantage of squatter how laws, to, how to invade the United States how, legally, how to invade the yeah. Yeah, and he was real fucking tough on that first video. Real tough. Real. I mean, look at his fucking face. Real Bro, tough. I w I would give. A larger amount of money to punch that guy right in the f***ing face. No, yeah. just being honest. Well, you know, and so this is him. Uh, you know, this is the money video you were referencing, Chris. Um, you know, he's talking about how good he's doing. He's received so much heat online. People have been doxing him, put out his address. Good. There's been pictures of his house that got put up. Um, and this, so this is him now. Yeah. With snot boogers going That's down, right. saying that they're Pussy. Coming, coming after me and uh, talk that what do you shit. Say, quote. Can, can you go back to the prior photograph? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, the child looks different too, doesn't he? Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. not so much. Okay. Yeah, no. Yeah, Actually, the child on. looks happier. Let's go. Let's go. See, go go to the one where he's got snot. Because that makes me happy. That's not a picture. That makes me happy to look at. After his cocky fucking shit the other day, that's what you get, dude. No. You, this is our country. It's not your country. You're not going to come here and fuck around with everybody. And, dude, it's only a matter of time before the American citizen does something to people like you who are doing this shit. No. Yeah. So, like, I'm glad that people are going after him. That's what needs to happen. The law's not doing their job, and people need to start standing up for themselves. 100%. So, I mean, in that video, uh, the one with the snot, uh, one of the, the lines he said, he says, quote, my people, they have gotten what they wanted. Uh, the envy has reached my family. Everything that's happening is because of your evilness. They want to silence me. Um, he also said something about. Um, no, they don't want to silence you, dude. You, he says, I am in danger of death in the United States. I need protection. That's correct. I'm being persecuted. My account has been blocked um, because TikTok shut his account down also. Yeah, well. Um, because they, uh, and they're, and they're. Uh, you come here and you talk about taking people's homes, dude. That's what they're going to do. Yeah, TikTok. A spokesman from TikTok told Daily Mail, the platform doesn't allow users to promote criminal activities, which is exactly what he was doing. Um, now, to your point, Andy, about Americans standing up. Uh, this is his mugshot, by the way, from, from 2022. That doesn't even look like him. No, it's definitely changed. I guess it's just how good America can do for somebody. <sighs> Um, but to your point, though, Andy, about you know America sticking together, um, this video that uh, has been circulating um, that I saw, you shared it to me actually. Um, it's it's freaking amazing. Let's check this. Oh video yeah, out. this is a good video. What's wrong? So you got two two illegal immigrants. It's America. It's America. It's a free country, guys. It's a free country. We can film in America. So this is this is interesting. So they don't want you filming their stuff in America. They're here illegally. Hablan inglés? No, no. Mexico or Venezuela? Huh? 
Okay, Venezuela or Mexico? No? Okay. So they're selling drugs out here, doing drugs out here. This is the America. This is the America the Democrats want. There you go. There you go. Hey, all right. Hey. Hey. All right. Say it again. Again. That's what, that's what they think of you, America. That's what they're watching this. These guys over here. What did you, you say? They're, they're throwing gang signs up, man, as if they own the country. But, you know, just like I'm sitting here, we're not worried about that, okay? We're just going to deal with what we got to. Whatever happens, happens. But I'm going to make sure that you're all right and that we're okay as well. Yeah, that's it. American people got to rise up. Man, we got to get Trump in 2024. This unquestionably, this all the Democratic Party stuff, man. This is what they brought our country to, and we got to stop it. As soon as Trump get in, it needs to be a mass deportation and watch them head for the border. Hey, we got a listener. He must listen to the we show. We got a listener. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, the temperature's changing, man. The temperature's changing. People, I mean, because we're seeing it all over. You got you got, you got got these illegal immigrants who should not be here. New York uh, City just passed a bill where they're giving them almost like $1,500 a month. Yeah, what are they giving to if American citizens? If they promise to only spend it on necess- like like essential items, like... Okay, um, you know, but but as Americans long as they are sick promise. of it. Yeah, they promise. Promise. That's they promise. Promise. You know, and so, but Americans are sick people, of it, man. People, um, look at this picture. This makes me so happy. <laughs> what a bitch! You're gonna get on the internet and talk all this shit, and then you're gonna show yourself crying with snot coming down your face. Fuck off, dude. Yeah, I'm. I, I, yeah, one hundred percent. I love that video of those guys. For those of you that can't see the video, because we're still most of our listeners on audio, it's it's two white dudes. Talking to two Venezuelans, they're flipping them off. They're saying "fuck you." They make a shape of a gun and then point at the guy like the they're Venezuelans shoot him. do. Yeah. yeah, and the white guys are like, "No, nah, dude, we're we can film you. We're not doing anything." And then they turn the camera, and there's these two black guys sitting in the car, older dudes, and those are the guys that said, "Hey, man, we need mass deportation." So well, if you didn't see, they were sitting there watching, making sure nothing happened. Yeah, to those that's guys. right. And they were protecting them. Yeah. And dude, and this is what we need. We need black people and we need white people who are American citizens to understand what's happening here and start standing together. And that Hispanic, is what these, huh? And Hispanic, yeah, for sure, citizens and well, Asian citizens, yeah, ev- everybody. Oh, but the main divide, the main divide that they try to create is between, between white and black. White and black yeah. But yes, we need all Americans to stand together. Mm-hmm. And this is a message that we've been saying on this show for years. These people are going to try and take your shit. And if we don't stand together and we don't look out for each other, there's going to be major problems. It's 100%, man. Guys, jump in on this conversation. Down in the comments, let us know what you guys think. With that being said, uh, let's get over to our third and final headline, headline number three. Headline number three reads, Sam Bankman Freed sentenced to 25 years in prison for orchestrating FTX fraud. This just came out today. It's a big topic. I don't know if you call this a win, but let's dive into it. Uh, SBF was sentenced Thursday to 25 years in prison for his role in defrauding users of the collapsed cryptocurrency exchange FTX. In a federal courtroom in Lower Manhattan, U.S., District Judge Lewis Kaplan called the defense argument misleading, logically flawed, and speculative. Uh, He said Bankman Freed had obstructed justice and tampered with witnesses in mounting his defense, something Kaplan said he weighed uh, weighed in in his sentencing uh, decision. Uh, Bankman Freed wearing a beige jailhouse jumpsuit uh, struck an apologetic tone saying he had made a series of selfish decisions while leading FTX and, quote, threw it all away. Uh, quote, it haunts me every day, he said in a statement. Um, prosecutors have sought as much as 50 years, while Bankman Freed's legal team argued for no more than six and a half years. He was convicted on seven criminal counts in November and had been held at the Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn uh, since. Um, in a statement following Thursday's sentencing, Damian Williams, United States attorney for the Southern District of New York, said Bankman Freed had orchestrated one of the largest frauds in financial history. Quote, today's sentence will prevent the defendant from ever again committing fraud and is an important message to others who might be tempted to engage in financial crimes that justice will be swift and the consequences will be severe. Uh, Bankman Freed uh, plans to appeal both his conviction and sentence. A spokesperson for his parents issued a statement um, on their behalf. Quote, we are heartbroken and we'll continue to fight for our son. Um, I just want to know, this is my only burning question, okay? Because we're talking, I believe it was something to the tune of like $8 billion. Yeah. 
Eight billion dollars. The company at one point was valued at like thirty billion, right? But eight billion dollars of people's hard earned money was given to this man. It all went to the Democratic platform, or a large majority of it did. Where's that money at? Where does does it is it gonna go? Like, what's the actual restitution on the people's part? Like, sure, he's going to jail. You know, might get a salad tossed a few times, but like, where's the money? Well, let's remember that Ghislaine Maxwell went to prison for trafficking minors mm-hmm. to nobody. Right. 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 Well, no, this is no this is no different. This is the same thing. Mm-hmm. The, I believe that this dude was placed in a position to do that. This he's guy's a, an idiot. He's mm-hmm. a patsy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. This guy's an idiot. He's a useful idiot. They played to his ego. They got him tons of money. He got to be around celebrities. Bro, he was so smug. Hit that troll of a girlfriend he had, too. Oh, fuck, yeah. Fucking thought she was hot shit. They were on the internet, on podcasts, talking about all this money they made and how rich they were and how they had this alternative lifestyle with, like, 40 people living in a house and they're all having orgies every night and they were, like, so smug about it. All the hot pockets you could possibly They didn't earn a fucking single penny and they took everybody's money, and then they gave it to the Democrat, who very likely the intelligence agencies or the Democrat, I'm speculating, placed this man in this position to, to do this. To do that, yeah. And I don't think he's saying it because, dude, they know that he'll get killed immediately. Well, his butthole is definitely Bro, I kid. had the craziest conversation last night. I, I didn't even get to tell you about this. So there's this guy... With this ditty, this Puff Daddy shit. Oh, man, that shit's or, wild. Listen, I'm not going to say this guy's mm-hmm. name, but this guy was very close to Diddy. Mm-hmm. Very close. And if I said who he was, you probably recognize his name. I okay. spent two hours on the phone with him last night. Okay? Mm-hmm. This dude went from A to Z all the shit these people do. Like, and it was insane. Like, and I even told him, I'm like, bro, I don't know that you should come on the show and talk about this because like it, 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 it's a lot of the shit that people speculate about. Like, no shit. dude, like satanic codes and Freemasonry and like all this crazy shit. He's like, dude, he's like, look, man, he's like, they fucking kill people all the time. They don't even fucking think twice about it. He's and he, dude, he, dude, it was. My understanding of the Diddy situation is that Diddy was essentially bro, I, Epstein for the rap industry. Mm-hmm. Is yeah. that, that's pretty much what I yeah. got. Yeah, but there's these people everywhere. Yeah. That's the thing. In all different industries. This is how they right. control all the shit. Right. Dude, we've said this on the show a hundred times. And this this guy who I was talking to confirmed all of those things. And it like, dude, it was it was crazy, dude. Like, wow. I mean, and he wasn't it wasn't bullshit. I mean, he was crying and like it was it, you know, you could tell when people are full of shit. This guy wasn't full of shit. He was scared as fuck. And he's like, bro, I'm afraid they're listening to me right now. And I said, well, if you're talking to me, they definitely are. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, uh, but dude, it was crazy. He went through like this Isaac Cappy shit. You know who that is? Mm -hmm. That guy that got killed after he started talking about all the people on Epstein's Island. He apparently committed suicide off the bridge. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, dude, it was was crazy shit. And like, he wants to come on the show, I think. But like, I don't know like how this... I don't know. Yeah. And plus, dude, I want to vet that. I don't want him coming on just saying all this shit without proof. We got to have some evidence. Yeah. I mean, we, there's ways to do it. We could put a voice changer on him and, you know, dim the lights on him. Give him a Kanye mask? Yeah. Give him a Kanye mask and deepen yeah. his voice. Yeah. Well, anyway, bro, it was so crazy. Fuck. I walked in the house and I had to put the put it on speakerphone so that Emily could hear what, what was being said because I was like, I've never done that in my life ever. I'm like, I just got to have someone hear this so that they know they know I'm not just making it up. That's it was fucking, fucking insane. That's crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, I mean, that, that's my biggest question. Like, because they know he stole the money. They knew it was stolen money before he, they even pressed submit on the fucking transactions. Do those, will the people get their money back? No. No. Yeah, I think, I think where is the money? That's, that's my question. That, that's the question. You asked that and that's the right question, I think. In 25 years, I, I I was looking at a chart, I think it was in today's journal, Wall Street Journal, that he, I think he, 25 years for a financial crime is either number two or number three in terms of the longest length of a sentence. And they have to serve 80%, I think. Is I think that correct? That, that's typical. 
Uh, Bernie Madoff was given 150 years. Yeah. That was his sentence. Did he steal as much as Sam Bankman Free? No. Uh, that I don't know. I, I don't, don't think, think so. I don't no. think so. I mean, this was. Let, let's pull it up. How much did Bernie Bernie Madoff, uh, Bernie Madoff steal? Elizabeth Theranos was pretty far down the list. She, I think, she got 11 or 12 years. Yeah, dude. I think this guy's just an idiot, and he he he, he got placed in a situation. Oh yeah, no. Bert Madoff was way more. Yeah, twenty billion. Oh okay. But this is second. He, he died, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he died in prison. Yeah, right. Well, don't steal people's fucking money. This looks like a um like a, a Pornhub thumbnail. <laughs> Doesn't it? He's gonna have problems in prison. He's gonna have problems. Yeah. In prison. He's gonna have. Problems. This ain't Shawshank Redemption, bro. You yeah. going down? <laughs> yeah. There's no chance this guy knows how to fight or anything. No. Look at him. They forced him to take the picture. Yeah. Yeah, he's going to have problems. Oh, man. I don't feel bad for well, him. Well, I don't either. Oh, okay. Why is the guy standing next to him, why is there not a black dot over his face? I don't know. Who is he? Because they don't, like, it's weird. There's four guys with black dots covering their face, so you don't know who they are. But there's that one one guy who doesn't look very friendly. No, he doesn't look friendly at all. Maybe that's his boyfriend. He's taking all the cornbread. Maybe they're a couple. It's possible. Yeah. He's taking all the cornbread for I sure. I mean, it does. Sam does look like a little woman next to him like <laughs> whatever you want baby he's so Sam's scared gonna, she's Sam's scared. gonna have to stock up on that syrup and jelly bro and that kool-aid packs man they wear that shit as lipstick in there oh uh, that's real shit how do you know bro like you you ever seen 60 days in or like scared straight bro like that's real shit they make you take the you take the kool-aid packet you know you lick and you, you dip your, your your finger in there and you like put it on your lips it makes it like lipstick it's real shit. You learn right, something man. every day. <laughs> well, hey, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. Guys, jump in on this conversation down in the comments. Let us know what you guys think. Uh, with that being said, we got to uh, our final segment of the show. We got thumbs up or dumb as fuck. Now, Chris, this is what we bring as a headline in. We talk about it, and we'll get one of those two options. Um, but I figured since we have a guest, to let you guys choose which uh which topic you want to do so what i'm going to do is i'm going to just show a picture of, of two different articles um and then you guys can make the decision of uh of what we're going to go wh what rabbit hole we want to go down on okay? okay um so the first picture first article here's your choice okay oh man all right so that's your first article ouch okay and then your second article is this one or two one yeah, I agree. One? Yeah. Damn, two was really good. Was it? <laughs> Two's good. But, uh, all right, let's go to one. Well, what's going on in this two? Uh, I right, listen. All right. We're going with, one, we're going with two, right? No, we're, we're going, going with, with this one. one. Oh, you want, the, you want the twins? Yeah. Well, it looks like a woman has two heads. What, what's going she on? She does. Yeah. So, you, oh, so this is where we're going. Yeah. Oh, this is great. It's perfect. Oh, this is the one you thought was good. Yeah, this is what I, yeah. Okay. This is, yeah, I mean, yeah they're yeah, both that, good. This is what, yeah. this was the one I was. Oh, okay. For. You want, they want yeah. this one. Yeah. All right, well, let's dive into it. <laughs> Our thumbs up or dumb as fuck headline reads, Abby Hensel is married. Conjoined twin who rose to fame in reality show Abby and Brittany secretly tied the knot with an Army veteran in 2021. Um, so these, these twins, they are conjoined right at the upper thoracic cavity, but they share everything else. Okay. Everything else. They got, they, got, they got two heads, but one body. One vagina. Right. Yeah, I get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One year. one whole body though. Every, yeah, right. Okay, there's not like multiple. Right, just one vagina. That's what one body means. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got it. Yep. Yeah, two heads up. Um, but yeah, so they were on a, a reality show. I mean, they're probably lucky to still be alive. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, I mean, I mean, surgery is not an option. You can't really remove that. Um, I don't know how you split a vagina. Yeah. All right, come on, let's go. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> what do you say? What do you say? He said you split an Adam, not an Eve. Oh man! All right, so an American teacher who shot the fame on a reality TV series with her conjoined twin, quietly married three years ago, uh, twenty-eight years after captivating the world with an appearance on Oprah. Abby Hensel, now thirty-four from Minnesota, tied the knot with Josh Bowling, thirty-three, a nurse and Army veteran in twenty twenty-one, according to public records obtained by Today. Um, Abby and her sister Brittany only uh, one. 
of only a few sets of Dicephalus twins in history to survive infancy, rose to fame on their eponymous TLC show, which chronicled their major life events, including their high school graduation and job hunting. Um, the pair share a single body, for, and from the waist down, all of their organs, including the intestine, bladder, and reproductive organs, are shared. Um, in a documentary film when the girls were teenagers, their mother said they were keen to have children of their own one day, explaining, quote, uh, that is probably something that could work because those organs do work for them. Um, quote, yeah, we're going to be moms, Brittany agreed. In another interview, Brittany reiterated their desire to have their own family, um, to have their own, saying, quote, the whole world doesn't need to know who we are seeing um, and what we are doing and when we are going to do it. But believe me, we are totally different people. Abby added, quote, yeah, we are going to be moms one day, but we don't want to talk about how it's going to work yet. Uh, Abby's relationship with Josh, who is a father of one, has gone under the radar until now with the twins leading a quieter life out of the spotlight in the last 10 years. But here's a video from the wedding day. Escape with me. I'll hold you tight. Let the sparks ignite the dark. You swallow our hearts alive. Run away with me. Leave it all behind. Call that two for the price of one. I don't think that's a deal. <laughs> I don't think that's a good Wait, deal. I mean, okay, so he, so the one now, the reason I th say that is not because like they're weird or anything, but yeah. like you got to listen to two sets got of two mouths now. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like you got two complaints, two two sets of rules, <laughs> two people telling you to take out the trash. Yeah. So Doc. <laughs> I mean, uh, so you see, we married the one on the left. Um, so what's the other one? She's yeah, she's voyaging. Does the other one get a? A husband or a partner as well uh, that would it? be really awkward and matt oh you know the the original famous siamese twins mm -hmm. who lived in the 1800s were were two men that i think they were they they were a little i don't remember the details but they were i think it was their torsos were connected mm -hmm. and they each had their own wives mm. and they had children and and very very, they were financially successful, hmm. and I mean, and they were. I think Siamese. I think they were from Siam, what the country of what was then Siam. I read about all this in the Guinness Book of World Records back yeah. when I was a child. But like, the, like they had phenomenal lives. Yeah, uh, they had children and families and and happy marriages and and amazing. I mean, look, dude. My amazing. take on it is everybody's got a right to be happy. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Like, yeah, and like, dude, you know, can't help that you're born and different, and you know, even if you're not born that way, when you can be different. I learned a lot of that when I got stabbed. Mm. Like when I got stabbed and my face was disfigured real bad for about a year and a half, my face was swollen up like like this big, like the size of a grapefruit off the side of my head, and uh, it never went down. So like, I had not just scars, but I had like an actual fucking grapefruit stuck to the side of my face for a year and like everybody treats you weird Every, nobody would look you in the face everybody looked away nobody would make eye contact and it and it taught me uh a very important lesson about people who have differences or physical disfigurements or like bro those are people too yeah. like and they have hearts and they have brains and they're they deal with this every day so like i mean as is you know like yeah. you can make little jokes about it or whatever, right? Yeah, it's probably awkward that they gotta like fuck the same dude and shit, right? Like, Low jobs, yeah. Man. But like at the same time, you know, it's it is what it is, and they're figuring out a way to make it work, and I think that's cool. Absolutely, yeah, I agree. So, yeah, yeah I don't, you know, who are we to judge? They look happy. Yeah, they, they do look, look they happy. Do look happy. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's cool. I and think he that's, looks happy. Yeah, I, he does. <laughs> he looks like he loves it. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm, I'm, it's all good, man. It's all good with me. Yep. Huh? <laughs> Did you say they got they, them pronouns? Is that the fuck you said? Bro, you, you're going to hell. <laughs> you're going to hell. That's oh, terrible. fuck. You're going to hell. It ain't even me, man. Like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's Madot. Madot and Joe. I'm trying to be cool. 
Hey, <laughs> I think it's cool, bro. I give it thumbs up, man. Yeah, thumbs up. Thumbs, thumbs up. up. All right. Yeah. Thumbs up. Well, I guys, think it's all right. Andy, Dr. Free. That's all I got. Chris, thanks so much for coming on the show, oh, man. This was a blast. Yeah, thanks, it's awesome. Thanks for having me, DJ uh, Andy. Dude. You guys, if you guys want to know more about his book, check it out. It's available on Amazon. It's available in bookstores. It's called Operator Syndrome. Uh, I think it'd be very helpful for a lot of you guys who are struggling, um, maybe not just with PTSD, but just trying to figure yourselves out, things that you can do, uh, try to get to the root cause of the problem, and um, I think you get a lot of benefit out of it. So give it a try, Operator Syndrome. Uh, dude, thanks for writing this book, too. Um, I think it's awesome what you're doing. It's awesome work what you're doing. Uh, I think it's innovating how people are fixing themselves and getting better. And uh, I just appreciate your friendship, bro. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate yours, Andy. Yeah. And I, I would just say, that, you know, part of the idea of the book is it's it's a book written. F it's a practical book. It's written for the community, but it's not just for operators and their families. It's also, you know, I think highly relevant to responders, law enforcement, mm -hmm. firefighters, Soldier or people who have dealt with soldiers. chronic stress for a long period of time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even CEOs that have built things yep. and done yep. things their whole lives, yep. you know, like yep. shit's hard, man. If you're a warrior. Yeah. Uh, it's the, the book may be for you. That, yeah. that was my that was my intent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, check it out, guys, for sure. And uh, don't be a hoe. Share the show.